In this video, I want to talk about antinatalism and social justice. I want to address some of what has been said by antinatalists amidst the Black Lives Matter protests, which have now evolved into larger anti-authoritarian protests. The subject of authoritarianism pertains to antinatalism as well, and I'll be touching upon that later in the video. I'm going to look critically at the idea that antinatalism is a social justice movement, and that, assuming that it is, it's also compatible with other social justice movements. And I'll be critiquing certain attitudes coming from people who are confident that antinatalism should be the central focus of social justice activists today. To start with, I came across some comments that were made by antinatalists during and about the BLM protests, where basically some antinatalists were somewhat hostile towards BLM activists, while others rebuked those antinatalists and argued that it's insensitive and it simply isn't the right time to push the antinatalist agenda forward right now. Here's an example, a Reddit comment that shows a certain ambivalence or confusion as to whether antinatalists should support BLM or try to supplant it, in a way, with the antinatalist agenda. Quote, It's probably better, from a public relations standpoint, that antinatalists lay low on this specific topic right now, BLM. But the whole thing is so complicated, I'm just not sure that videos about antinatalism should be postponed until much later. Frankly, I don't think that most nihilists of any color or ethnicity that are doing the protests now really care what antinatalists have to say about them. They are filled with both anger and hope, and those things do not simply have as their conclusion compassion and rationality, because the main problem here is the natalist delusion. But it may be worth not to discount the idea that adding fuel to the fire may be what can ultimately be the greater catalyst for change. Maybe all involved, which is the vast majority of people, as we are all tangentially involved in a topic like this, really need to sit and stew with the complicated, difficult, sad reality that what everyone wants to accomplish cannot be achieved with simplistic, cookie-cutter approaches that are the default of what humanity turns to. Maybe they need to contend with the facts that what the protesters are fighting for is tantamount to utopia, and that only fools driven to near insanity by the unlikely concoction of suffering, passion, brilliance, and the willingness to respect their fellow human beings as themselves will strive for utopia. End quote. This person believed at the time of writing that it's probably better not to push the antinatalist agenda but also asks that we entertain the idea that it might be effective to say to people fighting for racial justice that they are essentially, quote-unquote, fighting the wrong fight. That the real fight is the fight against life. I strongly disagree, and I think there is a pretty obvious irony in saying that fighting for racial justice is, quote-unquote, tantamount to utopia here, considering the position that is held by the commenter. But I want to take all of this seriously, and I will, in the rest of this video, address some of what is said or implied here. First thing I want to say is that, unlike the commenter, I don't feel confused about this, and I don't think it's complicated. I think you should support these movements as much as you can. And I'll bluntly state that I think framing the issue around timing is both naive and disconnected from reality. The problem, as I see it, is that this strand of antinatalism is a confused ideology so it follows that it's going to be confused about how to do basic outreach during these highly fevered times. By this strand, I mean the one represented by those who reach the conclusion that the end of human suffering, or sentient suffering, ought to be pursued as a social justice issue. This position is sometimes called extinctionism, but not all antinatalists believe this. Professor Tina Rulli says, quote, In my mind, an antinatalist is someone who opposes procreation or finds procreation morally problematic in many instances for any number of reasons, not limited to ending human suffering, end quote. But I won't be using that definition here because the view that dominates here on YouTube, and which has been popularized in academia by David Benatar, implies extinctionism. If you subscribe to another strand of antinatalism, this is not about your views, so bear that in mind. So, the issue of timing is presented by antinatalists now. Let's start here. 
I'm not part of any anti-nihilist group now, but I wonder what this argument is looking like internally. Like, when is it okay or not okay to bring up anti-nihilism? It's not okay right after an unarmed black person got brutally killed, maybe. But what about after two weeks or two months? I think it's clearly not the right question to ask. For as long as people are emotionally invested in this cause, there's never going to be a time where anti-racist activists don't think that anti-racist activity ought to be intensely pursued. The obvious issue is that if your agenda negates theirs rather than complementing it, they're not going to be receptive, regardless of when. BLM activists tend to promote an intersectional approach, so they support other social justice struggles as well. The problem, more fundamentally, is that antinatalism doesn't intersect with their struggle. Ideas advanced by antinatalists don't really have anything to offer in the way of support for them. And that's why they're not interested. It's not because of a delusion. Being alive and being invested in your life and the lives of your loved ones and trying to make them better isn't a delusion. But if it were, I mean, there would be nothing you could do about it. It seems true that the anti nihilist ideology does not contribute towards social justice struggles. Except in the case of animal rights, specifically the fight against factory farming, where many people intuitively feel like the non-human animals exploited and killed there would have been better never to have been born. So they can be reached with those arguments, I think. Other than that, there's no clear contribution made by anti nihilist activists that I can see. There is, of course, the tangentially related birth strike movement, but they explicitly reject the anti nihilist label. Their focus is not on morally condemning procreation or limiting births, it's environmental sustainability. In fact, birth strikers argue that population reduction is not a goal worth pursuing. They cite a 2017 study on their website from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, which quote, explored various scenarios for global human population change by adjusting fertility and mortality rates. It found that even imposing one-child policies worldwide and catastrophic mortality events would not significantly reduce the global population by 2100. It proposes instead that more immediate results for sustainability would emerge from policies and technologies that reverse rising consumption of natural resources. End quote. So, despite their temporary antinatal band, antinatalists cannot count even them as allies. To be clear, there's no denying that antinatalism as a personal philosophy or strategy can certainly be useful for supporting social struggles. When you know you'll never have children, you have less of a need for stability, and you have more time and resources to invest in activism. But antinatalism as a movement, again, antinatalism as extinctionism, doesn't seem to align with social justice struggles or represent one. Two fundamental characteristics of social movements are the belief that they can make a difference for some living beings in the here and now, and that they can organize politically to that end. They don't just talk and debate with people as individuals. If you don't organize as a group with a political purpose, are you really a social movement? You can't put pressure on your government, you can't make demands, you can't express solidarity with other struggles and support them meaningfully, and as a result, they can't also support your movement. This is a key part of how social movements gain more exposure and adherence. Antinatalism, on the other hand, either antagonizes other movements or has nothing to contribute to them as a movement. Oftentimes, antinatalists are simply unconcerned with these movements. The general sentiment is that things have always been bad, and they will remain bad, and no amount of effort is going to fix the broken system that is life. People are overwhelmingly seen as deluded life addicts. This doesn't give you the sort of hopeful, future-oriented mindset that activists must maintain, nor does it give you the mindset to connect with people on a basis of mutual respect. Benatar, in his Better Never To Have Been, doesn't mention social struggles. Race and poverty get a single mention each, and only to say that they are the source of problems for people, and that they have always been, 
therefore justifying antinatalism. But this is a non sequitur. That life involves a lot of bad, and that it has always involved a lot of bad, does not logically lead us to the conclusion that antinatalism is a solution, or the solution. Even if we were to grant that Benatar's case for antinatalism is internally consistent, which some antinatalist thinkers would disagree with, this does not suffice to say that it can turn itself into a solution, i.e. a project of liberation for humankind, or sentience. For something to be able to liberate the human species, or sentience, it would have to not only be logical, but applicable. Antinatalism would have to be political, yet the word politics does not appear in Benatar's book, and the word political appears only twice in order to discuss the ways that, quote, pronatalism op operates, end quote. The focus is entirely on the abstract and the ideal, on the degree to which things are bad, and on logical constructions and arithmetic. Antinatalism is presented as the only possible solution to social problems, to the human predicament, and yet its focus is uniquely on the moral sphere, not the broader human sphere, the sphere within which ideas can be put into action. The book, along with virtually all that has been produced on this subject, is bereft of an analysis of existing socio-economic structures and power relations. This is how Benatar can make the absurd claim that, quote, the misanthropic argument is not in the least incompatible with the philanthropic one, which he leaves fully unsubstantiated, but which we will touch upon later. In his book, Benatar writes of a hypothetical, quote-unquote, last generation. Contrary to the individualistic last man from Zapfe, who is an iconoclast, Benatar presents the idea of a generation which would pursue an antinatalist program voluntarily, as a collective. Although this is not fleshed out at all, it's evident that this is a world in which Homo sapiens would have to be drastically different from the Homo sapiens of today. By virtue of being a voluntary program, it must be assumed that in order to accomplish this fantastical task, this animal that we are would somehow have transformed itself into a being that is overwhelmingly other-regarding, self-negating, and inconceivably unafraid of pain. Prior to this, crucially, we would have had to be socially organized in such a way that we would not want to deceive or exploit each other as the collapse of societies advance. We could all trust each other's ideological commitments, the quote-unquote chosen ones who would bear the worst of the suffering resulting from the self-engineered collapse of global civilization at the very end would all do so willingly. Throughout the whole process, the world would have to be unified and synchronized. Power vacuums and pro-life rebel groups looking to capitalize during the rapidly accelerating collapse would be a thing of the past. Self-sacrificing altruism would rule human behavior, and rationality would override the instinct of self-preservation, turning it into a complex drive for self-annihilation. Let's do the impossible and grant the possibility of this happening. Since this is not the being that we are today, the antinatal paradox should become obvious. In order for this state of affairs to exist, it would have to evolve. What's evolution? Change over time. Change over time means building upon the efforts of generation after generation, therefore necessitating procreation. For the antinatalist program to be followed to the end, the human species in the world would have to be radically different than it is today. But antinatalists argue that people should stop procreating now, and they are very often morally condemning people after the act, on the ground that it is unjustifiable to have children, or mistakenly assuming that one less birth is one step closer to human extinction. How do antinatalists address this paradox and this assumption? Benatar makes no point to say that the current order of things stands in the way of this happening, that the only world in which we can conceive of an antinatalist program being pushed through voluntarily, consciously, and successfully, is one where organized human life is horizontally structured, meaning human beings would have abolished all forms of hierarchy in competitive political programs. Only in a world without dominance hierarchies could we quote-unquote walk into extinction voluntarily.
Now, you might say, yes, but this isn't the only option. Antinatalism as a political program could be imposed by force. In which case, if we go through the intellectual exercise, we run into a similar problem. The world would have to be very hegemonous and ruled by an exceptionally powerful and stable world government in order to be able to carry out an antinatalist program until the end. An antinatalist program that is local would be useless for obvious reasons. That area would be overtaken and world population would stabilize right back up. So the world still has to be transformed. If this were the last generation, it would not be possible to build this powerfully stable, all-encompassing global institutional structure. Additionally, enormous amounts of suffering would have to be imposed, making this a much more difficult selling point for the ideology. And if history and current socioeconomic conditions are any indication of this, it would not be imposed upon the world population equally. Where there is hierarchy, there are always justifications for why certain groups ought to have the power to exploit and discriminate against others. Those others would of course be resisting against their oppressors. Another paradox becomes visible here. If a group has this kind of power over others, then they will not be the kind of self-sacrificing person Benatar has in mind. They will never be able to transform themselves in that way, for they are bathing in the intoxicating waters of coercive power. A transformation is only possible where it has been prefigured. You can't have a means-to-an-end approach to social transformation. Where liberation is concerned, the means must also be the ends. The very nature of the process of hierarchical ascension is to foster egoism and ruthlessness. It's been shown, for instance, that the richer a person gets, the less concern and empathy for others they will have. The ultra-wealthy's priority is to maintain their wealth and power, which they feel that they deserve. And this ties into a process of social reproduction, where those who are at the top of a given society seek to reproduce the beliefs in socio-political systems that help them to get there, and that allow them to maintain their power. Social and cultural reproduction is of crucial importance, yet it's never explored in antinatalist theory. To put it another way, if you have a group that has the monopoly on force, and it has the power to control human reproduction, then it follows that they'll also have control over other aspects of your life. No matter what this tyrannical group purports its goals to be, it's never trustworthy and never benevolent. The idea of a benevolent dictatorship that could push through an antinatalist program is a contradiction in terms, in the same way that China or North Korea is. One can imagine a benevolent dictatorship that will pursue its own demise, its own withering away, In the same way one can imagine a person walking on water, by ignoring structural reality. Living things, small and big, have a purpose to them. Their purpose is to maintain their structure. Societies are no different. A society is a higher order system, but consisting of living things. So the purpose is the same. In the same way that you, personally, wouldn't be willing to give up your capacity to obtain the means for the continuance of your life, Societies will not willingly give up control and ability over their continuance into the future. Now, I brought up China and North Korea, and I think it's worth exploring the similarity between antinatalism and authoritarian Marxism in a bit more detail. Both seem to share the same idea that you can program human beings with a certain quote-unquote scientific understanding and believe in a vanguard's ability to enlighten or lead the masses towards liberation. If you're not familiar with this term, a vanguard is basically an elite group of people who see their role as educators and leaders, and who represent the interests of non-elite people, and can guide them towards liberation. According to the vanguard party, all the masses have to do is trust their judgment and authority, and go along with their socio-political programs until they are liberated. Of course, such liberation never happened. Instead, working-class movements and marginalized people were deceived, trampled, and exterminated. Where Marxists argued that, if they were to get control of the state and the means of production, the state would eventually wither away, antinatalists often have a similar naive view of power, imagining that if you got the right people in positions of power, people with the right understanding of life, the state could lend itself to an antinatalist program, which would reduce and eventually abolish suffering. But as mentioned previously, there's no reason to believe this. 
What we know about centralized power is that it cannot be trusted to advance the interests of those not belonging to the ruling class. Whatever good intentions some might have before gaining power, power transforms them. The means transform the ends. Unlike the Marxist vanguard, though, the anti-nihilist vanguard is not concerned with the potential liberation of those who are alive. It's said to be protecting the unborn from ever becoming enslaved and wanting liberation in the first place. Liberation is non-existence. And who stands in the way of achieving that desired end? For the Marxists, it's the bourgeoisie, which doesn't know any better. For the anti nihilist it's the delusional breeders who don't know any better. This attitude towards those who stand in the way of the liberation of non-existence is something like, we did the arithmetic, we did the philosophizing, we are rational, and we know you would have been better off not being born, and that you should not impose life on someone else. This I know better, this I am rational and you're deluded, is hugely problematic for those who wish to claim that anti-nihilism is a civil rights issue because it's absolutely not the hallmark of a transformative social movement. It's not interested in equality, liberation, and it doesn't speak for itself. Today, a social justice struggle is usually looked at in this way. I exist on this axis of oppression, or multiple axes, and I will fight for my life, because I want my life to be better than it is now. And of course, this extends to your loved ones. This is completely different from an anti-nihilist agenda, which claims to know what's best for everyone, that no one exists, and which does not fight to improve one's life. It's not surprising that there are going to be anti-nihilists who antagonize people and engage in victim blaming as a result of having this mentality. I think these behaviors simply follow the logic of an ideology that is centered on the idea that people are reckless and deluded about their experiences, and irrational in their judgments, which of course they can be, but that's a species feature, it's not a group feature. You're not outside of it. If you assume to be special and outside of that, then it does follow to engage in victim blaming. You're just being consistent with your views. But at the same time, that illustrates precisely why antinomianism is not compatible with social struggles. You can't negate people's experiences and desires and at the same time champion their causes. If you're disavowing the misanthropic adherence of antinatalism and you promote an idea of antinatalism for social justice compatible with other movements, then I can't currently see or even conceptualize it. There's no axis of oppression for the antinatalist that fits into an intersectional framework. The oppressor for the antinatalist is nature itself, its life, or it's more specifically life having evolved the processes that have made consciousness and emotions and feelings possible but this exists outside of the quote-unquote matrix of domination. Another way to put it would be to say that everyone who is struggling against forms of domination share at least one thing in common. They're fighting against bare life. They're fighting for more life, from the desire of living a fuller life. And that's necessarily a future-oriented agenda. This is what binds all social justice agendas together. Antinatalism, and I'm not saying that people don't have good intentions here, precisely makes the opposite demand, the demand for less life, and the demand for people to give up future-oriented projects. To his credit, Benatar talks about this latter problem in his book and regards it as a legitimate harm, but he follows quote-unquote the numbers, and ultimately makes the claim that the sooner it happens, the better, giving us this sense of urgency and the need to advocate for antinatalism right now. The right to die agenda, which on the surface seems to be about less life, is in fact about more. It's a demand for more investment into healthcare, for the church to stay out of people's lives, for more recognition of the marginalized people who suffer chronically and often invisibly. It's about having more freedom to unburden their loved ones, emotionally and materially. It's a demand to secure the means of guaranteeing that more lives will be able to end in dignity in the future, making the totality of a life more worth living. It's a fight that serves human life. People are more likely to enjoy their lives or feel less dread about it if they know that they have this option available to them. There's a pro-social, qualitative game that has no parallel in antinatalism. The next point that I'd like to touch on is the idea that antinatalism can solve racism. 
I touch on this early on, and I'll just briefly say a couple more things. First, racism, the kind that begins with pseudo-scientific pretensions, is usually said to have largely emerged out of white people's imperialist interests in the 16th century. The scholar Ibram Kendi points to systemic oppression's origins actually being in the 15th century, where a chronicler called Zurara introduced the idea that Africans were inferior and justified slavery as an opportunity for their religious salvation. This idea, quote, began to seep in and stick into the European cultural psyche, end quote, and a few hundred years later it reached America. What's not discussed in Candy's book, or most anti-racist writings, is that race is a social construct which was built upon a speciesist construct. Basically, it allowed Europeans and later on Americans to see black people as animalistic, less than human, and this gave them the justification they needed to deny their desire for autonomy and self-determination and treat them with the same disregard they had for non-human animals. It's not something that's inherent to our species, and it's not something that we have to do as a species. It's something that we learn. What's socially constructed can be socially deconstructed. It's not tantamount to utopia to consider that something constructed can be deconstructed. Of course, this is not to say that conflicts based on perceived differences in cultural diversity can ultimately all be avoided, but racism in its current form can be greatly disempowered if we address its false assumptions and the material conditions that gave rise to it. We probably all know people who have went from being racist to being anti-racist. We might be one of them. From this, we should understand that the extent to which racism can be solved is the extent to which we can challenge prejudices in a constructive manner. It's often very hard, and since racism has a long history, built on an even longer history in speciesism, this problem is very persistent. But a solution doesn't have to solve every instance of a problem in order to be a solution. If antinatalists argue that a problem such as racism cannot be properly addressed because it's ultimately a problem that pertains to the broader category of life, they're not making a claim based in knowledge, and they will only alienate themselves and fail the people who exist and struggle today. I think that aside from the issue of vanguard thinking previously mentioned, the belief that antinatalism can solve racism or any other social problems is a form of cruel optimism. In her book Cruel Optimism, Lauren Berlant analyzes some of the reasons that human beings cling so firmly to hopeful ideas. She defines cruel optimism as, quote, a relation of attachment to compromised conditions of possibility whose realization is discovered either to be impossible, sheer fantasy, or too possible and toxic, end quote. What makes these attachments cruel is not just the harmful impact of the objective desire, but the sense in which the object comes to provide something of, quote, the continuity of the subject's sense of what it means to keep on living on and to look forward to being in the world, end quote. Without the object of our desire, we fall apart. Underneath of a cruel optimism is an existential abyss, and yet severing ourselves from it poses the only real possibility for growth. As Berlant writes, quote, why do people stay attached to conventional good life fantasies, say, of the enduring reciprocity in couples, families, political systems, institutions, markets, and at work, when the evidence of their instability, fragility, and dear cost abounds? End quote. The idea of antinatalism as a cure-all solution to all social ills could be seen as a positive illusion, something in the distant future that we can always strive towards. But I have to agree with Berlant, the attachment to its utopian vision is not positive, as it impedes our growth as individuals and precludes any truly liberatory action from occurring. It leads people astray. It alienates them from meaningful resistance, from building bonds with others who struggle. The idea that if you have a headache, a bullet through the head is the solution should make us laugh. But... When the same logic is applied to an argument for antinatalism, many people take it seriously. The negation of people's desires and the rejection of everyday struggle in favor of one impossible solution is never going to reverberate powerfully.
And this isn't just an issue of optimism versus pessimism or realism. It's an issue of localizing a problem at the right level of analysis. The solution to racism is a broad, intersectional anti-racism, as imperfect as it is. If one wants to be optimistic about a cure-all solution, why even pick anti-nalism? Why not say transhumanist bioengineering, I'll let David Pierce, or argue for the implementation of some fantastical utopian virtual reality world? Here, I think Nietzsche had something to contribute when he spoke of, quote, the resentment of those beings who are prevented from a genuinely active reaction and who compensate for that with a merely imaginary vengeance. I think underlying this cruel optimism, we also find the liberal presupposition or assumption that, quote-unquote, truth will out, in Shakespeare's words. That there is a battlefield, a marketplace of ideas, and the best ideas eventually come out victorious. There's no recognition that knowledge is always embedded in power structure. Instead, arguments are divorced from power. That is to say, they're divorced from reality. Reason is seen as this infallible light that pierces through illusion and falsehood and can definitely establish what is and isn't true and what ought or ought not be done. If we only follow reason, we will be fine. No time is spent considering the darker side of reason, a darker side which exists because one of reason's main functions is to gain people on your side. And in order to do that, you don't necessarily need to be reasonable or to rely on classical logic. Sometimes deception, distortion, omission, and exaggeration work better. Sometimes he who shouts the loudest will end up drowning the others, and some people are impressed with that. The notion that debate inevitably leads to a greater understanding is false, and most of the time, especially on the internet, narcissistic gratification is prioritized over learning and mutual understanding. Almost exclusively only in scenarios where there is mutual respect between communicators can a greater understanding actually be reached. The laws of thought do not lead to the realization of a fundamental truth divorced from power. Not that power is intrinsically problematic. The issue is whether the form that power takes is one of attempts at injury, domination, appropriation, or resistance to those, and empowerment in one's life. Reason has a number of so-called flaws that have been made apparent by social and behavioral psychologists. What explains them? Clearly, we have evolved the ability to use reason because it was selected for. It's useful and can be used to challenge one's prejudices and misconceptions. But it's a function that is adapted to a pro-social context, a dialogic setting, where there is an interactive back and forth. Where reason appears to misbehave, it's in situations where such interaction is prevented. To be reasonable is to realize this, to realize the limits of reason, to distrust oneself, continually reevaluate ourselves, and reflect on the contextuality of knowledge. Unfortunately, pro social and loving behavior is becoming increasingly impossible in today's world. Market forces have atomized us and sold us a false image of ourselves. There's too much noise in communication. There's a lot of information, but little knowledge. Brutalizing power is winning over liberatory power. This results in an inability to have constructive conflicts with others. We no longer care to integrate the other, the enemy. We only care to see ourselves in others, to have ourselves mirrored back to us, and to replicate ourselves in others. Byung-Chul Han, in What is Power, writes, quote, Nietzsche does not limit the range of power to human conduct. Rather, he elevates it to the status of a principle of life as such. Monocellular organisms already strive for power. Let us consider the simplest case, that of primitive nutrition. The protoplasm extends its pseudopodia in order to search for something that offers resistance, not because of hunger, but because of the will to power. Even truth is interpreted as a process of power. It is the perspective of the powerful, which the powerful inoculates into the others, thus continuing him or herself in them. Truth is a medium of power. Power secures the continuation of a type, thus it creates a continuity. Philosophers, too, strive to extend their perspectives to 
and thus to continue themselves. This is how Nietzsche interprets Plato's belief that even philosophy is a kind of sublimated sexual and procreational drive. End quote. From this view, philosophy does not exist outside of power dynamics. Philosophy is one tool of possible empowerment or disempowerment, but it serves a reproductive purpose, the reproduction of the ego into the altar. In other words, we reason and debate with each other in order to colonize other people's mind with some of our self. The idea that one's activism has evolved out of pure reason or pure concern with others is false and deceiving. Colonizing other people's minds can be a violent act, where it disempowers them or gives them a narrow or false understanding. For as long as antinatalists weaponize reason and empathy and present themselves as the ones who are truly caring and truly rational, they can expect fierce resistance. Human beings are only momentarily other-regarding, and we're never purely rational, impassioned. Emotions can't be divorced from reasoning. As the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio and others have shown, even the pure mathematician is emotionally engaged in his work. What makes antinatalism activism so hard to do in the world is not just due to its sheer utopianism, its desire for biological salvation through extinction, but its disempowering and impractical nature. What makes so many antinatalists so fearful of engaging in activism is precisely that which they claim is possible to destroy, the homeostatic imperative. The imperative that drive living systems to maintain themselves through time. Fear is an emotional response that arises when one's biological systems feel threatened. One's biological systems feel threatened when we advocate for views that are not pro-social, because we're social animals. The social world shaped us to be who we are. It encompasses us. It's not separate from us in our understanding of the world. Even for people who are sympathetic to its appeals, antinatalism is easy to reject due to its lack of praxis its apparent inability to challenge the systems of life. Social problems do not improve. Marginalized people's daily reality does not change by investing in these ideas. No matter how much we care about them, this is not going to change. The nature of totalizing perfect solutions is that they're far removed from reality and from most people's daily experiences and goals. As Voltaire said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. It's worth pointing out that social anarchists are traditionally accused of being utopians in this way, and their concerns dismissed as a result, but this criticism does not apply to them. Social anarchists might have an idea of a perfect society, or a near-perfect society, in the form of a lack of hierarchy, but this vision does not get in the way of what is good to act upon today. The means and the ends are aligned. They engage in direct action that helps marginalize people today, and they attempt social experiments in certain zones of resistance in order to show the legitimacy of their ideas. They're not mere dreamers, their ideas have anthropological backing, and they're fully aware that the world that they want to live in will never be made possible if it's not prefigured. What anarchists understand, and what antinatalists who wish to make antinatalism a social justice struggle need to understand, is that, historically, when you fought a social injustice collectively, you could sometimes make your life better, even if it's just slightly so, and even if it's just temporarily. It can't be understated how much people value that. The promise is empowerment today rather than salvation later. People are very much interested in that. When there are only far-off goals to invest in, their patience can be exhausted. You can't rely on an ideology that only promises something in the far future even if that something is very promising. That's not a sustainable motivator over time for most people. It's a source of frustration. Most people's lives are hard here and now, and your ability to influence them is going to depend entirely on whether or not you can convince them of a path of action that can make some kind of difference for them and their loved ones in the present or the near future. Antinatalists face a seemingly intractable problem because they make their case by appealing to the interests of those who do not exist, and not for their future interests while living either, unlike those who are concerned with specific social and environmental problems affecting future generations, but on the basis of the non-existence perceived would-be interest in not having existed no matter what.
Now, I think I understand why some people remain hopeful about antinatalism's chances of succeeding, even though crucial concerns about its ideology and practices are not addressed, and despite the resistance that they face every day if they speak about it, and the obvious stagnation of what some may call a movement. I've named cruel optimism and ressentiment, which I believe often plays a part, but I also believe there is an error made by antinatalists who believe that they truly understand life. This despite not knowing very much about it on a scientific level. This conviction is enough to remain invested in the project. It's enough for them to know that evolution appears to be a pointless process that generates a lot of suffering. And I get that. The suffering is truly horrifying. And most people don't really pay attention to that. But I think the right response to it is to direct one's sadness and outrage towards constructive ends. Ends that do not reproduce the systems that we have constructed as a species and which are responsible for a lot of the suffering. We have some control over those systems because they are socially constructed. We have no control over the laws of thermodynamics through which life emerged. Sadly, by narrowly focusing on life as the oppressor, many antinatalists do not care about the part that they play in reproducing systems of oppression, of which they have some control over. It's inconsistent to concern oneself with the sole fact of biological reproduction and the suffering that it enables while not concerning oneself with other forms of reproduction in which we can all play a part. Sexism, ableism, racism, ageism, classism, religious persecution, or the reproduction of ourself into others through violent means. I also think that it's a profound error to elevate this selfish gene theory to the level of absolute truth. Armed with this certainty, it's understandable that antinatalists would then make the opposition to life itself their central concern. But the problem is that no one seems to be particularly concerned with the fact that this theory has received a lot of criticisms. It paints a very restricted view of evolution, and it's not been able to provide an answer to numerous challenges. I will post a link to some of those challenges in the description box. You can also pause the video right now if you want to read them on the screen. Another reason why this optimism persists, I believe, is because online antinatalist groups have kept growing. And there's been a few instances of the subject being mentioned in the media. One person last year sued his parents and received mainstream attention for it. And the phenomenal film Kafarnam also exposed people to this very idea. The topic might have gained a bit more interest within academia as well. This might seem promising to some people. But none of this actually means much if the ideology can't have any political clout. This isn't defeatism, this is a simple fact. I'd argue that in today's age, the age of the spectacle, just about every idea can be used as a curiosity designed to generate clicks. To cheer representation in the mainstream media is to miss the point that representation on its own only leads to co-optation, to the disarming of an idea. An idea has no transformative power when it's fetishized or commodified. No ideas are immune, the idea of suffering and the idea of extinction included. It can be presented to the masses because it generates controversy and entertains, which generates profit. The phrase, the revolution will not be televised, exists for a reason. What is mediatized is so because it's not threatening to business as usual, or it's mediatized in a specific way in order to limit its threat to business as usual. Ideas that are consumed are not necessarily reflected upon or acted upon or not meaningfully so. Antinatalists often fall into the trap of fetishizing life's horrors online. Its condemnations lead to an impotent, if not self-defeating, form of activity, which benefits the corporations who own those platforms. Online outrage, no matter about what, is only minimally beneficial to those who engage in it, as a way to blow off steam and be validated by others who feel like us, but it's rarely constructive. Eventually, its benefits turn into something detrimental. The sameness that comes with echo chambers. The sameness of narcissistic gratification, of seeking those who reflect our own views back to us. It's easy and riskless, and where no risks are taken, no transformation is possible. Progress occurs when the dominant order is challenged, 
at any level. As trans historian Susan Stryker says in Disclosure, quote, everything can spin on a dime. We can't think that just because you see trans representation that the revolution is over. Having positive representation can only succeed in changing the conditions of life for trans people when it is part of a much broader movement for social change. Having representation is not the goal, it's just the means to an end. End quote. An increase in representation is good only if it can lead to a change in material conditions. The greatest challenge for philanthropic antinatalists who believe in its revolutionary potential is still to show how, even with greater representation, these ideas could start legitimizing themselves in the world as it is or as it's shaping up to be. Okay, assume that I'm wrong about the total incompatibility of antinatalism with political action. Assume that antinatalism starts something politically. What can antinatalism realistically accomplish without being part of a broader movement? Or how does it become a part of it? There's a rift between the misanthropic and authoritarian camp and the libertarian and philanthropic one. It's not going to be bridged. Their methods to achieve their ends would be completely different. One focused on voluntary libertarian goals of supporting human and non-human rights, while the other is necessarily going to advocate authoritarian measures on such things as population control, immigration, and distribution of resources. Misanthropes can also believe in accelerating the multiple crises that our global interconnected world faces today by supporting far-right politicians and militias so as to bring an end to organized life faster. If they want to move forward, philanthropic antinatalists have to make a decision whether to include or exclude these advocates. By refusing to exclude them, they would have no chance to be included in any intersectional movement. There are other things that could have been mentioned in this video. I chose to touch on numerous things instead of going into depth about any one of them. Most importantly, I believe an exploration of the concept of homeostasis and its application beyond biology and into the social and cultural realms is necessary in order to realize the full extent of the cruel optimism of antinatalist theory. I may address that in a later video. Thank you for listening.